So, good morning, everyone. So, um, we just waiting for the host. I think Elena is on her way. So we just gonna. I'm just a Zoom monitor. So I'll make sure that you know people can get in right now. So there are quite a few still waiting on the waiting room. So if anything, the uh, Evan or Richard and you guys want to you know sit try to get something for us to, uh, to make sure that we got everything covered, just let us know. So the session had been recorded, so probably Aaron would edit later on <laughs> for us to do. Uh, yeah, once Rich connects, he'll be sharing his screen uh, for the actual presentation. So we'll make sure that's all set up. Okay, let me make you co-host too. So, all right, let me get that. So I'll make um, Rich, Richards and Evan co-host. Okay, thanks, Bob. Hmm, Elena, I would, I just ping her. I wonder if she's still on traffic somewhere. Hey, Evan, Bob, are you guys seeing the, uh, um, the presentation? Yes. Yep, looks good. I just let um, Erlina and she was in the waiting room, Bob. Right. Um, I just add her in right now, so she uh, should be in. Okay. So I did. I did let the rest of the. I, I, I let quite a few in, but uh, we'll be still waiting for. I just wanted to make sure we got all the duck in a row <laughs> before we let all the right. rest of the team in. Yeah. So Alina, you are the the co-host too. I mean, I said you the co-host, so now you can take. <laughs> take all away. So should we let uh, the rest of the crews in, or should we just? wait until everything that we got ready here. Alina? Um, oh, let the rest of the people in. Okay, and uh, Rich, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I'm gonna take question, questions throughout. And Rich, can you pronounce your last name again one more time for me? Uh, uh, Spara. Spara, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so if you're ready, I'm gonna let the rest of the team in, okay? Okay. Yeah, now go ahead. <laughs> oh, we'll wait until the nine thirty. Uh, yes, I think I'll start at nine thirty. Yeah.
Welcome folks, we'll get started in just a few minutes. At the bottom of the app. <laughs> Just another minute or so and we'll get started. Welcome. The anticipation. <laughs> Oh, I have the bottom of the hour. So our presenters think we're ready. Got a full lineup for us. If I, I'm, I'm ready if it's 9.30. All right, welcome. This is your first of several sessions over the next several days. So we're excited to have you. I got my ASU shirt on and everything. So you are in the presentation called Behind the Wiz, Rise of the Biodesign, Critical COVID-19 Trends Dashboard. Throughout this meeting, I will be your host, not the presenter. I'll just help be helping manage Q&A. And I wanted to put in the chat some reminders to you. And that is, you'll see that, that check the website um, after this event for your next session. Um, share your reactions in our Slack channel. Remember that you can celebrate each other with our celebrations form. And then don't forget to claim your badge at the end of the agenda. So with that said, I will turn it over to our first presenter to introduce themselves, Rich Sparrow. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. Hope you're doing well and you're staying safe. Um, as Arlena mentioned, my name is Rich Spera. I'm a business intelligence developer with Knowledge Enterprise Analytics. Um, with me is my co-presenter is Evan Tieslink. He's a management research analyst um, also at Knowledge Enterprise Analytics. Um, we're going to be talking to you today about the Biodesign Critical COVID-19 Trends Dashboard um, and a lot of uh, what goes on behind the scenes and how we actually make those uh, visualizations and get the data. Um, some of you probably don't even know that ASU has their own um, COVID-19 trends dashboard, um, has a lot of valuable data points um, on um, seven-day trailing averages, positivity rate, things of that nature. Um, so uh, with that said, I'm going to start moving on to the presentation. Um, so before we get started, I'm going to talk about the project requirements because that kind of helps shape how we decided to go about um, completing this project. Um, the first one was the data had to be updated by 10 a.m. daily, which isn't that big of a deal because most of our data we need to get done by around 7, 8 a.m. Um, the second requirement was it had to be available to the public. 
Um, and this was very unique in that um, pretty much everything we do is internal to ASU and usually internal to specific groups of individuals. Um, so this is a very, um, you know, different requirement for us in that what we had to publish needed to be available to anyone, even if they didn't have an ASU right. Um, so that kind of shaped early on how we, why, or how we went about trying to solve this. Um, the data needed to be timely and accurate. We needed to recreate epidemiological vis visualizations that were done in Excel and Plotly. Um, Evan and I are not um, epidemiologists. We don't work with public health data. So we really had to lean on the experts, um, you know, have them explain to us what the formulas were that we needed to use to, you know, recreate, um, you know, certain um, data points and figures. Um, and then the data we were pulling, it was publicly available data. Again, this was another um, unique requirement in that most of the data we pull, it's internal to ASU, it's database, databases we own. Um, instead, we were going out to these publicly available data sources to get the data. Um, quick disclaimer here, um, Evan and I are not trying to tell you this is the best way to solve this project. Um, rather, given the um, resources and limited time we had, th these are the different ways we've went about trying to solve the project. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Evan. He's going to talk about the dashboard progression and some of the earlier levels. Great. Thanks, Rich. Um, as you can see here, uh, we went through about four different iterations uh, for the project, and we'll go into each of those in quite some detail. Um, we just want to point out here that, you know, we started with just a single Excel file being put into Tableau Public, and it ended up with a more uh, intricate um, automatic data polls feeding into um, ABOR's own Tableau server. So we will talk how we got there, as well as um, some recent updates we've made. So our proof of concept was back in May, Biodesign came to us and said, you know, we have this Excel file um, and we have these two charts we want. Can you put it into Tableau? We're like, yeah, no problem. So we, our tutorial proof of concept was, are we able to take this epidemiological data, uh, recreate their visualizations and, you know, put them in Tableau. So we could do that and we were happy. We thought the project was over, but then, um, Biodesign wanted us to do more. So the project uh, right off the bat um, instantly expanded to a lot more. Next slide. So our first iteration was um, we used a Tableau file, or sorry, uh, we had an Excel file and we went to New York Times and the COVID tracking project, the two recommended data sources that Biodesign gave us. Um, and we pulled the data every morning, uh, put it into the Excel file, republished the Tableau workbook to Tableau Public, and then, you know, did a quick QC to make everything work, made sure everything looked right. Um, the positive modifier with this level is we were able to create several different visualizations with the same Excel file using the same data source, um, which Biodesign really liked because we were able to not just take the two epidemiological graphs that they wanted, but we could do five or six more. Um, our negative modifiers was um, this iteration was extremely manual. Um, we had to wake up every morning uh, <laughs> early and uh, go to these sites, pull the data manually, manually put into Excel, make sure the formulas are good, then go into Tableau, manually update it. Um, and just it, it just became too much every morning. The other issue is limited scalability. Um, Excel has a size limitation for the file, so we knew at some point um, it, it just wouldn't work out. Next slide. So our second version is instead of Tableau, we use Google Sheets. Um, Tableau Public is uh, interesting in that it doesn't let you create um, automatic like updates. It all has to be extracts that don't update. Um, the exception is Google Sheets. If you connect to a Google Sheet, um, when you update the Google Sheet, Tableau Public will automatically see that and update your visualizations without you having to republish. So that was very cool. So what we did is we set up uh, data sources using Google Sheets, which, um, as you see on our positive modifiers, uh, no more manual data polls. It was great, um, except huge asterisk. Um, New York Times counter-level data. Um, at this time, we were publishing 
uh, COVID visualizations for the entire US for every single county, which is around 3,500. Um, and it's just the files are too large. So uh, we knew, uh, well, there's just a lot of issues, um, not just the fact that the New York Times county level data is too large, but also um, we were using ASU Google Drive, which required us to re-authenticate every seven days. So every week, at least once a week, we would have to republish the entire Tableau uh, public file. Um, we also ran into issues with testing data where, you know, it would be July 15th, but all of a sudden the charts would stop at July 1st. So there's two weeks of data that are just missing. Um, and we didn't really know why. Um, another issue with using Google Sheets um, and the formulas we use to automatically pull the data into Google Sheets is that if the website changes their layout or if they change their chart layout, um, it breaks and you're either pulling in the wrong data or it just doesn't work. Um, with this iteration, we also had to check almost every day to make sure that it was still working. So that was a limitation. And um, there is also still limited scalability. Uh, Google Sheets has a limited size for how many cells you can have in a file. And we knew that every day with the county level data, we were adding 3,500 new rows. Um, so at some point in, I think it was either, it's gonna be right around now, uh, mid-November, December, we would run out of space on the Google Sheet. Um, so we had this deadline, we knew we need to figure something else out. Um, and eventually that's what we did. Uh, next slide. Before we move on, um, we wanted to take the time to show you some cool things we learned along the way that, you know, while they didn't solve our problem, they were still cool and they could solve your data problems. So this first ability is um, using these uh, Google Sheet functions, formulas to pull data from a website. Um, so this is actually the one we used um, when we were pulling from COVID tracking project. Um, so just sort of to start at the middle formula and work our way out, it's just a import HTML and that's it into a query. Um, with import HTML, it's really cool. You just uh, put three things, the, you know, the website you want to go to, whether you want a list or a table, and then um, the index, which one you want. So if you put in a website that has three tables on it, you could put three and it would pull the last one. Um, so that was a really cool functionality. Um, because Google Sheet has a size limitation, we couldn't pull every single column from COVID tracking project, we had to limit it. So we did that using the query function, um, which query just takes two arguments. You put in the data you want, and then you type out your query. Ours was very simple in that the data we wanted is just the import HTML function. And the query is just, you know, select certain, certain columns. In this case, um, one, three, and four, you can see from the picture here. Um, but you could do anything. You could say, you know, select everything where the date is after June 11th or where cases are over 10,000 or, you know, whatever you want. It's, it's the, it uses Google visualization API language, but it's very similar to SQL. So if you're familiar with that, you can um, do all sorts of fun stuff. Um, and that's it. I'm going to pass it back over to Rich to talk about more of the uh, advanced iterations. All right. Uh, thanks, Evan. So um, as Evan had mentioned, with level two, we were still stuck with having to manually pull down the New York Times county level data just because its size was um, too large. It would time out with the Google Sheets function. Um, we did some research. We found out that um, Alteryx, you could do an Alteryx workflow to output your data to a Google Sheet. Um, so once we figured, we found that out, we then um, we created a Python script that would automatically pull down the data from the New York Times GitHub site. We then had an SSIS package that would load that data to our SQL server. And then we had an Alteryx workflow, which would output the data to the Google Sheet. Um, we still had to use the Refresh Now button in Tableau Public. Um, even though we only have one positive modifier here, this was actually a very big, um, you know, it sh should be counted for multiple in that there was no manual data pulls whatsoever. Um, we still had quite a few negative modifiers, though. Um, our Alteryx workflow would occasionally fail. You know, a payload would go missing. It'd have to, you know, do 20 payloads, and payload 14, which might be 25,000 records, would just wouldn't show up. 
um, or it would fail altogether with these random errors, you know, like that the Google sheet sizing was wrong or something, which I have no idea how to fix that other than we would just delete the sheet and reload it. Um, every now and then the Altric server would get backed up and our job wouldn't finish until after 10 a.m. And one of our requirements was that the data needed to be done before 10 a.m. Um, and that's because that um, every week on a Wednesday, they do a press briefing where they go over the different visualizations, trends, um, you know, speaking with the press. We still had to reauthenticate our Google Sheet every seven days, which meant we had to republish it manually. We were still checking the data sources just to make sure everything was good. And we were still stuck with the limited scalability issues. Um, but uh, one of the cool things was SSIS and in particular the DT execute um, command line utility. So I'm going to talk about that briefly. Um, DT execute, it's a command line utility which you can use to um, execute SSIS packages. SSIS stands for SQL Server Integration Services. Um, you can create SSIS packages two ways. Um, you can use the SQL Server, um, sorry, SQL Server data tools or the import export data wizard. That is the easy way. Um, I'm not going to actually show you how to create a package because there's quite a few steps in it. But after you, you've created your SSIS package, you want to save that package to your file system, and then you're going to create a, a .bat file using Notepad, which is going to execute the SSIS package. Now, there's four components to this um, .bat file. Um, the first is the path to DT execute, which we can see down here. We then have the forward slash F, which stands for it's a file. We then have the path to our SSIS package, which we can see here. We then have the greater than sign. And um, the third part is an output file for success or failure. Now, the output file, that's um, optional, but I highly recommend it. Um, I, don't, I don't talk about this later on or show you anything about this, but what we do is after every SSIS package executes, we have a Python script that goes through each of those files and it tells and it, it looks to see was the SSIS package successful or did it fail? And it then sends us an email telling us this package was successful or this package failed. That way we knew we knew at certain points in the, the process if we had problems and we need to manually rerun it or if something broke and there was bigger problems. Um, last but not least, um, after you've done the first three components, you're just going to save that file, and then you're going to add it to a task scheduler task, and then it's going to run um, as scheduled. The um, next ability we're going to talk about is the Altrix workflow. Um, this is the actual workflow we used when um, loading our Google Sheet. Um, I do want to apologize. I don't remember all the icons or the tool names, so I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have my mouse hovering over them. Um, it, Altrix is an incredibly powerful tool. Um, if you don't use it, I would highly recommend you, you try to find a way to use it. You can use it for ETL. You can use it for running jobs where you have to maybe um, deliver a file to a person every week, every two weeks, or every month. I actually have quite a few jobs that I have scheduled via Altrix where it pulls down data and then it emails this person who wants this file every Monday. Um, so it's an incredibly powerful tool. I would highly recommend it. Now, um, our workflow, which I lost my mouse here for a second. I'm going to go through here. This first icon here, um, we're connecting to our SQL server, and I'm querying our New York Times COVID county level data. Um, next, we're getting the max date from that table. Um, it's not actually important for the record set or any of the data we need. It's, um, it's used in the purposes of this workflow. I then append the two together so that each row has that max date. And this is where the max date becomes important. It's in this filter, uh, which has a little triangle on it. If the data is stale, so if the max date, I think, is two days or greater, the data is considered stale, I don't want to go through loading 300, 400,000 records onto a Google Sheet. So it short circuits. It goes down this bottom path here, and it sends an email to the team saying that the New York Times county level data is stale. If the data is not stale, we're going to follow this um, top path here, where here I have this select tool where I'm selecting all the fields except max date, because I don't need the max date. It's only for the purpose of this Altrix workflow. I'm then outputting the data to the Google Sheet. Um, here we have these um, sample icons. These are incredibly important if you're going to be using Altrix to send emails, because Altrix is designed, um, if you send an email the way I did here, 
that it sends an email for every record. So if you have 400,000 records, you are going to get 400,000 emails. So the sample tool, I'm just doing a sample of the top one. So that way I'm only gonna send one email. And so in this um, the top path here, it sends an email to the team saying that the New York Times data was refreshed. Um, I also used Altrix's built-in, um, I think it's called events, where you can, um, before your job kicks off, it sends you an email saying this workflow started. And then it will also send emails when your workflow fin um, finishes, whether it was successful or if it failed with errors. Um, so I also use those, uh, um, that functionality. Um, actually, before I uh, move on, did we have any questions on Altrix or SSIS? So, Arlena, you can post your questions in, in the chat. But right at this time, I don't see any questions. Okay, um, I'll just keep moving on. We can always um, go over those later on, too. Um, so, at this point, we were at a crossroads. Level three was not sustainable. It was failing far too often. We, um, it's probably about two days a week, our Altrix workflow would fail. Evan and I would have to manually go in, re, um, you would pull, the, pull down the data from New York Times, load it manually to New York, um, sorry, to our Google Sheet. We also knew that sometime around November, December, our Google Sheet was going to run out of space, and we essentially were going to either have to stop publishing certain visualizations, or we were going to have to find another solution to do so. Uh, so we reached out to our boss, explaining you know the problems we had, and then she reached out to Mark, uh, Mike Sharkey, who then put us in touch with Brandy and Grant. Um, Brandy and Grant let us know that there actually is um, a group on the ABOR server that you can publish to, um, you know, to make public to anyone outside of ASU. It's, um, it's only for um, certain types of visualizations and our, you know, what we were publishing met the criteria to be used for this. Um, so after that, um, what we did is we got rid of all tricks and Google Sheets altogether and all of our data polls were done via Python scripts where we're pulling the data down via Python. Um, we save it off as a CSV file. We then have SSIS packages, which pick up those flat files, load it into SQL Server. We then have Python scripts, which would schedule the Tableau extract, and then it would pull the Tableau server, the ABOR server, checking for the status of the extract refresh. Once it was either um, completed successfully or um, it failed, we'd send, we would get an email notification saying, you know, the Tableau server successfully, um, you know, completed the refresh or it failed. Um, and as you can see here, we have a lot of positive modifiers. Our entire ETL process was automated. It solved our scalability, scalability issues. We can easily create more Python scripts to pull down new data sources if it's decided that, hey, we need data from this place. Um, we can easily create new tables in SQL Server. We have email notifications throughout the entire process. So Evan and I do not have to manually go and check to see, hey, did we get the data today or are we missing two weeks worth of data? It reduced the complexity. We don't have all tricks in Google Sheets. We moved calculations into SQL Server that were in Tableau, and we have more control over the entire process. Um, you know, we're not dealing with Altrix and um, Google Sheets, whereas Altrix, a lot of other people are using it. So if a job gets backed up, there's not anything we can really do about it other than wait. Um, the one modifier or the one negative modifier we did have is that if COVID tracking project changes their data source or adds new columns, it breaks our SSIS package. Now, there's nothing we can do about it. They do have a website where they announce changes, but you can't subscribe to it. So it's just one of those things that you find out your package or your extract files. You go to your web, their website and you realize, oh, they added four new columns or they removed columns. Um, but we did find a way to mitigate that. Um, and I'll talk about that, that in a little bit. Um, so the first new ability we unlocked is Python. Um, and here's actually the Python script we use to pull down the data from COVID tracking project. Um, there's three libraries we import. The first is the Pandas library, which is a data science library you can use for data transformation. Um, next is the OS library, which is, uh, which you use for working with your operating system. And then we have the re request library, which is um, an HTTP API for you know, pulling down data, making a, um, API requests. Um, we have two variables, the URL, which is the COVID tracking project um, URL, where they, keep their, they make their data available. We then have our new file um, variable, which is where I'm going to be saving our CSV file. And um, we have three functions. You only see two right now, but you'll see the third in a second. The first function is our ETL, where we read the data in from COVID tracking project, and we output it to that CSV file. 
Um, the second function is our email function, which we're using SMTP, where it sends an email notification saying if it was um, successful or not. Um, and then I also have this fail um, function, which is basically the same as the email function. It's just used for failure. You can actually combine these two functions together um, where you pass the arguments, you know, your subject and the, um, the, um, the, the message text. Um, as arguments, we call those functions. So you could reduce it just to one where so um, you'd call it and you'd say, if it happens here, you know, I wanted to say fail or, you know, this package was successful or this failed. Um, last but not least, where the actual um, execution happens, we have this try catch, Python calls it a try accept, where we, I check to see if the, the file exists. If it does exist, we remove it. I then do, I call the ETL function and then it, um, I call the email function. If the file doesn't exist, we do the email function, or sorry, we do the ETL, we do the email, and if any of the code fails in that try, try block, it then jumps to the accept, the catch block, and it executes the failure email to let Evan and I know that this failed. That way we can go look into it. Um, Earlier, I mentioned that you know, if COVID tracking project makes changes, it breaks um, our SSIS package of the extract. So um, Evan and I, after having it fail a few different times, we decided the best way we could handle this was by having a backup table. And um, what we do is we have an SSIS package which copies our main table from COVID tracking project prior to everything running, and it um, inserts that data into the backup table. So we'll have two day old data and then our main table will have a day old data. And then we have this control of flow SQL where it checks to see if our main table has data. So if there are no rows in our main table, sorry, I lost my mouse here for a quick second. It jumps to this first select block where it's gonna execute this statement from the backup table. So our visualization will use data that's two days old. So if our SSIS package fails, it's going to execute this first select statement. If our SSIS package is successful, this is not going to equal zero, so it jumps to the else block here and it executes the select statement here, where it's going to be taking the data from our main table, which is the table we prefer to take from, but it's better than having a visualization that is completely blank, which did happen a few times. Um, so this is the way we decided to handle this. Um, do, um, are there any questions, Erlina? And then we had a couple questions come in regarding this solution that you're going over. One is someone want to under to know whether you considered or you tried using Python to write to the SQL server rather than the S S I S package. Uh, yes, I actually did. Um, so the um, originally when we first implemented this, I think I had to get it done in a day. So um, I went with SSIS because I knew it, I knew how to execute it, I knew how to have it work. Um, so that's why I went with SSIS. The, um, one of the new enhancements Evan will talk about, I decided I'm gonna try to do this with Python. I went to the Microsoft documentation, I looked up how to use Python to um, import or to um, you know, push data directly into SQL Server. I followed all their documentation, it failed. So I start looking at the error, start going to Stack Overflow, and I probably spent about three hours and I couldn't get it to work. And so after that, I went, you know what? I'm just gonna go with SSIS because I can get it done in 15 minutes and it works. Um, so I did try using Python. I just couldn't get it to work. Um, it was just one of those things that I ran out of time. Um, and the other question, thank you, Rich. The other question that we had was they were curious whether Python is running on the same server as the SQL server. Um, no, they're, uh, they're they're different servers. Um, I do have the, um, the the Python runs on a virtual machine, not our BI desktop. So I do have a virtual machine that runs where it runs all the Python scripts, the SSIS servers, those things, or the SSIS packages. Okay, and hopefully I did the question justice for folks. And that's if not, you can unmute and ask more. But at this time, that's all the questions. Okay. Um, so now bringing all this together, so you're going to have bat files that are going to execute all of your Python scripts and your SSIS packages. You'll then have a task scheduler, or sorry, you'll create a task on task scheduler where you're going to define your start time and the frequency. Do you want this to run hourly, 
daily, weekly, monthly, or some other random frequency, um, and then whatever time you wanted to start at, 9 a.m., 10 a.m., 5 a.m. Um, you add actions, which are what you want the task to actually do. So you want to execute this SSIS package. You want to execute this Python script. Um, after you do that, um, what success is going to look like is this image, which is my email um, inbox every morning at around 845. Um, Evan and I, um, we decided the best way for us to not have to really spend a lot of time looking at it was just to put if something failed or was successful at the very um, beginning of the subject. So you can see all the emails say success, success, success. Um, if it was a failure, it would say fail right at the beginning. Um, we played around with it a little bit. Um, and at first we, um, we, we didn't follow this uh, recommendation. And so we have to look at each email, you know, to see, okay, the COVID tracking project, all extract was completed successfully. So this made it just a little easier where we can look at the first letter and then, or the first, um, first word and know, okay, we don't have to look at this at all. Um, so I'm going to hand this over to Evan now and he's going to take us home. All right. So everything from here on out, uh, we're still using our level four infrastructure. Um, we just want to talk about all the changes we've made, like since we started working on this PowerPoint to today, we've had a bunch of different content changes and we kind of want to talk about how do we do that. All right, so we're calling this our DLC, our recent updates. Um, since our level four infrastructure, it's very easy to add data sources um, or different visuals using the same data sources. Um, it gives us a lot of flexibility uh, because we solved the scalability issue. Um, so the three main updates we've made um, recently is uh, we did a lot of, we did, well, not a lot, we did like two, uh, but we did a lot of uh, visualizations for the actual testing lab um, at Biodesign. Uh, yeah, yeah, ASU Biodesign Clinical Testing Lab. So the people who you know get do the saliva tests, they get the data, they test them, they send it out. Um, we are able to have access to some of their data. So we have graphs for you know how many tests they do each day, um, how many are students, how many are non-students, um, how long does it take them to turn around a test? Because they want, ideally, um, they want more tests every day and they want it to take less time. So we can graph that and we can show them. Um, the other thing we did is we figured out positive test rate. Um, Apparently, in the last couple months, that's sort of what the experts have been using to measure success or failure. So we made maps for the U.S. and for just Arizona, um, U.S. by state and Arizona by county. So we can see what's their seven day trailing average for positive test rate. Um, and then we made a function, a feature that shows you, um, is, it, is this higher than yesterday or is it lower than yesterday? Is it the same? So you can quickly see, you can look at Arizona or Oklahoma, whatever, and say, Oh, are we trending up? Are we trending down? How are we doing? Um, so it gives you a rough, um, lets you just see what's what's going on. Um, the last one we did is new cases per 100,000 people. Um, Arizona is uh, an interesting state because, uh, you know, Maricopa has four and a half million people in one county, but, you know, Greenlee has 10,000. So when Maricopa has 1,000 cases and Greenlee has 200, you know, how does that actually like, what does that actually mean? So we use the new cases per 100,000 people uh, to normalize all the measures. Um, and then we created a line graph. So you can look over time, how is every county doing relative to other counties in Arizona? And you can say, oh, okay, where are the hotspots? Um, where do we need to kind of focus our attention and testing? Um, so yeah, our positive modifiers with future expansions, um, the way we have it set up, it makes adding these changes much easier. Um, we, instead of taking, you know, five to 10 days to get a visualization working and tested and looking good, um, we can do it in a couple hours. Um, but that's also the negative modifier is it makes adding updates easier. So, you know, we've been doing this for six months and until I guess there's a vaccine, we'll be doing this for the foreseeable future, adding more content, making sure everything looks okay. Um, whatever other measures people want or metrics, we can add it to the website. Um, and then quickly, I want to talk about the impact uh, because this is, you know, a six month project and this is a very serious topic. Um, it's really cool to see it being used and positively impact the community. Um, so as Rich touched upon, the media impact of all this is, you know, every Wednesday morning, uh, Dr. LaBear 
um, does a press briefing. So he talks to people in the press about what's going on at Sona, the US, what are the trends, how's everything look? Um, and he actually goes through our dashboard um, and you know changes the measures, plays with some stuff, shows some trends, points things out. And it's actually really cool to see um, these visualizations used like that. Um, as far as community impact, um, there's been over 300,000 unique visitors since we started in May, um, which is great. You know, people are using it, people are looking at it. Um, that's what we want to see. Um, and then for ASU, um, just recently, oh, there it is, November 4th, um, uh, Josh LeBaire and um, I think the whole Biodesign team won the uh, Governor's Celebration of Innovation Awards. So just everything Biodesign is doing with COVID, they were recognized for their innovative approach, um, you know, the saliva testing, the whole new test they developed, the quick turnaround time, um, these dashboards played a small part in it. So it's cool to see Biodesign and ASU being recognized for their work. Um, and then we also include some tweets from um, different members of the press. Um, you, you can see from the dates, uh, October 21st and 28th, those are Wednesdays. So these are um, people from the press tweeting on uh, the day that the weekly press briefing happens, talking about, hey, this is what uh, ASU, what Dr. LeBaire is talking about, um, talking about the metrics that we're posting on the website. So it's very cool to see this impact. Um, and then uh, I'll turn it back to Rich and he can show off the dashboard. Um, and here we have, um, this is actually a link. I have a website pulled up already, but you can click on this when the presentation shared, it'll take you to uh, the website where the visualizations are posted. The link was also posted in the chat because we can't, at the oh. end, when we get the presentation, they can click on it, but it's also, put, um, Hansa posted in the chat for us. Um, awesome. Thank you, Hansa. Um, so here's the Critical COVID-19 Trends uh, website. So um, the first visualizations you see are actually just kind of the metric scorecards. It shows you know, where we are in terms of our cumul cumulative numbers, where we are uh, daily, you know, how many daily tests did we run, how many positive tests. We then have our lab metrics, how many total tests has the lab ran, what are the number of uh, you know, total test process today and the average turnaround time. You can then scroll down here and you can select different visualizations to see. Um, this defaults to the new cases per 100,000 people. So you can scroll down here and you can see each county and you know how it compares at you know, per 100,000 level. And as Evan mentioned, you can see there's a little arrow where it will show, you know, compared to yesterday, it's up. Um, scroll up here. Then, uh, is this the line graph, Evan? Nope, never mind. Uh, um, I think we're talking about the testing one. Maybe AZ COVID-19 positive test percentage. Oh, that one, okay. And then here's another one where you can see the, um, the, um, you know, the positive test percentage per day, which are these little X's here. This, uh, the red line, the seven day trailing average, you can see it's starting to go up. And then our cumulative um, test percentage in the last 14 days, it's been flat. And you can change this here to go back, you know, as far as you want. It defaults to 14 days, but if you want to change it to 60, you then see, you know, where we've been in the last 60 days. Um, from the uh, US maps here, we're going to click on the second one, which is the new cases. Um, actually, no, sorry, wrong one. I want to do the average positive test rate by state. So you can see all the different states, what their positive test rate is, you know, and how they compare to each other. And then for, um, for the biodesign testing, we're going to click on the testing volume. This shows the number of tests we ran. It's broken down by um, non-students and students. And then the blue line here is the um, seven-day trailing average. And again, it defaults to the last 14 days, but if you want to see last 60 you can see we have these peaks here and you know the trailing day um, seven day trailing average kind of smooths it out so you can e easily see what the charge truly is um, all right, so to recap um, we went over uh, google sheet functions ssis python all tricks um, and sql control of flow um, you know, thank you for joining us are there any questions um we have a question or 
kind of a comment from Zachary. He wants to know, he's not sure, but have you invested control in to get stuff directly into the SQL server? Um, no, we've not looked into control M yet. Um, that was actually one of the um, options Grant And we don't use control. I think we only use control and maybe for one job in total for our entire unit. Um, so that's why we didn't um, pursue it for the Tableau extract. But I've not um, thought about it for, um, you know, the Python at all. I didn't even know that was an option, actually. It could be. Could be. We can we can uh, connect with UTO and chat about that. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine it would probably just be. Um, you know, maybe calling stored procedures or something like that. But I, yeah, it'd be, it'd be interesting to see what's possible. So I think if there's anything else, we could go ahead and end and we'll see you in the next sessions. All right. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Um, we appreciate you joining us and letting us, um, you know, share what we learned along the way.